You're listening to Catholic Family Podcast, Episode 1. First ever episode of the Catholic Family Podcast. I'm Kevin Davis, and I'm here today with my first ever guest. That is Father Carlos Borja, a good friend of mine that actually, we go we go way back, Father. Yes, we do. When, when, when was the first time, when was the first time we met? What, do you remember, what, what year would that have been? I believe... Boys game. Yes, it was, I believe, 2000 and either three or four. That's crazy. So so we're, we're pushing 20 years of knowing each other. How scary is yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's frightening. <laughs> what, 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 where are you? Are, are you based in, in Omaha now, Father? I am, yes. I actually have been here my entire priesthood. Um, I just completed eight years as wow. a priest. And I've been here um, for over, I think, 17 years now here in based in Omaha. Um, wow. And I 17 years with my high school, uh, my seminary, and then my priesthood. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about your path to the priesthood later, which I, I play, I, I would say, a very large part. I imagine you would probably see it a little differently. <laughs> Um, but we'll talk about that and we'll talk about that a little later about the, your path to the priesthood. I, I want to talk about first, because of your, obviously your, your past with the CMRI, you're not, you're not technically part of the CMRI and maybe you can explain that a little bit as well. The difference between being literally in the CMRI and being on, you know, under Bishop Piverunas, um, because that's something that I think confuses people. Hey, go ahead and explain that now, Father. What, what's the difference between secular and religious priests? So the thing is that the, CMRI priests uh, belong to the congregation itself. So they are religious who take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And they have their rules and their constitutions that they follow. Now, the secular priests are not religious priests in that aspect of taking the three religious vows. But nevertheless, they work under His Excellency Bishop Perverunas, and he is the Superior General of the CMRI, the Congregation of Mary Immaculate Queen, and we work with, under the bishop, and we work with the CMRI priests. So we, like I said, are not technically a part of the congregation through means of the vows, but nevertheless, we work very closely together. And so when we say CMRI, what, what does that mean? What, what is the CMRI, Father? So the CMRI stands for the Congregation of Mary Immaculate Queen in Latin, Congregatio Maria Regina Immaculate. And it's a religious congregation that is dedicated to spreading the message of Our Lady of Fatima and especially devoted to Our Blessed Mother and also uh, very much preaches devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary according to uh, the teachings of St. Louis Marie de Montfort, uh, especially the total consecration to Jesus through Mary. And when 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 was this um, congregation founded? It was founded in the 19th. In the 1960s, the late 1960s, I believe it was around 1967, it began in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And it actually began with the approval of the bishop of the Diocese of Boise at the time. I believe his name was Bishop Sylvester Trainen. And uh, it was just a group of laymen and laywomen uh, who did, wanted to live a life in a community. Uh, and they were, like I said, devoted to Our Lady's message of Fatima. And so they began with the approval of the bishop of the diocese, and uh, that was, like I said, their focus, helping to uh, spread that message. And so I guess fast forward, what, 20 years, and Bishop Piverunis kind of took over the reins in, in what, the, the late 80s? Is that right? That sounds correct. Yes, I believe it was around 1986, around 86. There. Okay, and then he he kind of took over and moved the. I guess his he came to what did he came to Omaha in 89 or 90? Is that right? I believe somewhere so. around there. Yeah. yeah, somewhere around there. And and he was also consecrated bishop around that that same time. So he was consecrated in 1991 by 91, Bishop okay. by Bishop Carmona. Bishop Carmona, and 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 his line comes from from 
from where? From Archbishop Took. From Archbishop Took, right. And so, and, and Bishop Carmona, he's another interesting one that actually I thought maybe down the line we could do a, an interesting show about him because you, your family has a special connection in a way with Father with Bishop Carmona. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. My family, my grandparents knew Bishop Carmona before um, before the changes came about in the church with Vatican II and all that. And uh, so they knew him from from before then. He was a professor in the seminary there in Acapulco in Mexico. And uh, my family actually uh, happened to know him very well later on when the changes came about. He helped guide him through all that, and uh, he informed them about what was going on in the church. And uh, he actually was very close to my grandparents, and he baptized a handful of my uh, of my aunts. He did the wedding ceremony for my mom and dad. Uh, so he was he's very very special to us. That's fantastic, and and I've heard stories that he was. He was known to be a, a very, very holy man and and, and unfortunately died in, in a horrible accident, I think. He did. Now, my uh, grandparents have quite quite a few stories that we can probably share in another uh, talk, but they, they were very amazing and very uh, they were very much taken by by how holy he was and how good of a man he was, and especially with his, his uh, fervor and his uh, strength in defending the faith, et cetera. And he, so so Bishop Perunis was consecrated by Bishop Carmona in 1991, and Bishop Perunis then went to Omaha and founded um, the the church in Omaha that you and I obviously both know very well. So a little bit of background for, for me and Father, we both went to high school together. We were actually in the same class together for, I guess— it wasn't actually that long, crazy enough. I guess two, what two and a half years, and then and then you left for the seminary, that, or two years even. Yes, that is correct. I believe. Let me think. I believe you came out in our tenth grade year, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, well, maybe even the ninth grade year. I can't remember. Um, no, it was tenth, been, tenth grade. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so I tenth grade, eleventh grade, and then I ended up graduating um, at the end of the of your eleventh grade year. And then you ended up going to the seminary, which again we'll talk about. We'll talk about a little bit later about your your path and and where we come from. But just so people know, that's why I know Father. We go back a long time because we both attended school under Bishop Peverunis and uh, many of our good friends who are also priests and um, sisters, and also many of our classmates went on to become religious as well. And that's something I kind of want to talk about first, Father. Is that I think. When you and I were in high school, we talked about this before we went live, that when we were in high school, the there were, I think, maybe 12 or 13 sisters of the of the CMD, um, the Congregation of the Mother of God. So a little different than the CMRI nuns who are – actually, could you explain that real quickly, Father? Yeah, so the uh, CMRI nuns, obviously, they belong to the Congregation of Mary Immaculate Queen. But when His Excellency moved to Omaha – um, there was a need for him to have sisters that were directly um, under him, so to say. The sisters were the CMRI sisters are headquartered in Spokane, Washington, at Mount St. Michael's. But he needed sisters that would help him out here uh, in Omaha and in, in the surrounding areas when he moved out here, when he made Omaha his headquarters. So he founded the Congregation of Mary Immaculate, excuse me, of the Mother of God of Mater Dei, the Mater Dei Sisters. And uh, they are, like I said, directly under His Excellency, and they assist him here at the parish. And uh, they also have branched out to other schools around the uh, around the country in different states. And uh, the CMD sisters that have grown, like you mentioned, since we were here, they've I believe they recently reached um, over 30 uh, members in their wow. congregation. And a lot of young vocations have. Uh, have joined from, and a lot of the of their students have uh, have gone on to enter the convent. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. I mean, right when we were there, and so we were there what, when we were in high school. Then that must have been about fifteen years ago, I think, when we were together in high school. And so I think, yeah, twelve or there were twelve or thirteen sisters of, of the CMD total, and they were spread out. I think among maybe three, three or four different states. Um, and and the, by the way, the CMD, for anyone listening, the CMD are the sisters you might see often in just black and white habits. The CMRI are often are, are always in, in blue and white. Uh, they don't have any black, do they, Father? They're just blue and white, the CMRI. Correct. Right. Blue and okay. white. So, so if you see in the, the singing nuns are, are, are known as the CMRI, though 
I really must say the CMD sisters have really, really gotten to be quite good singers themselves. They just don't quite yet have that reputation that they have. Um, the Samurai has has also in in Spokane. Um, yeah, it's incredible to watch the the, the growth. And, and like you said, the age is just I think that's just it's amazing to watch the youth. I mean, I, I, I see on Facebook, I follow some of these mothers from from the parish in Omaha who take pictures are really fantastic uh, photographers and very diligent in keeping up with with, you know, documenting these um the, the various steps for the priests and the seminarians and the sisters and which is really great for people who obviously are are in different countries or different states and it just it it blows me away how young these these sisters and seminarians are and i think that that's something that i i really want to talk about with you just the just the the optimism that we should have because i think you know we see the world crumbling around us and and i mean how how does that help you to see youth and energy in, in, in the, in the, the new religious orders? Well, it's quite invigorating and very refreshing to say the least. And it's very beautiful to see the, the youth because of the fact that his excellency um, has mentioned many a times, many a time that uh, our vocations are going to come from our Catholic schools. And so, especially for myself being a teacher here at the Academy in Omaha, um, just the investment that one makes as a teacher into your students. And you see that, um, so to say, pay off, not only in religious and priestly vocations, but even in good uh, Catholic families, um, students that have gone on and, and, and have married and are raising, like I said, good traditional Catholic families, uh, the vocations that have come out of the school, just very encouraging and very, uh, like I said, invigorating and really helps to continue to put as much energy and effort into into the work that we do as possible so father this this growth we're talking about I, can you go into a little more a little more detail about that what, what what are what is this growth where are these these seminarians coming from and, and where are they where are they i guess stationed in in the u.s so we have two major seminaries besides our minor seminary and here in uh in Omaha, we have seminarians from from several different countries. With the two seminaries combined, we have about 21 seminarians. Uh, we have someone from France, uh, another one from Scotland, a Canadian. We have several Austrians, and we have someone from Argentina. Uh, but they, they're here on student visas and obviously studying towards the priesthood. And are any who is the farther? I shouldn't say who is, but are there any that are far along in their um, steps towards the priesthood? So I would say we have uh, several or a couple of them that are tonsured. So we have um, the one from Scotland and the one and one from Austria and the one from Argentina. They both are uh, clerics. So they were both ta they were I should say three tonsured back in October. Uh huh. And are they are they secular priests or CMRI priests? Secular or seminarians, I should say. Yeah, sec secular. Okay, gotcha. And so, how many secular and how many um, CMRI seminarians? Um, so I'd say twenty-one combined. Combined. And so, what? How many of each? So I would say about fifteen. Uh huh. Um, here in Iowa, and then that would leave what six in uh, in in Colorado, where they have their religious seminary. And in Colorado, they're building that huge church, right? Yes. Yes, they are. That's awesome. I've seen some pictures of that, and it looks unbelievable. Beautiful, like this big wooden church. Yeah, and I, be I believe it's uh, in, in the western slope, if I'm not mistaken, in Olathe, Colorado. Yeah, right. right. And, and is Brother Xavier still up there working on the house no. or working on the church? He's actually here in Omaha. Is he? Ah, Okay. Well, that's nice. He's he's another one I haven't seen forever. Good old good old brother Xavier. <laughs> cool. And and then so you said and then the sisters there were thirty three. How many were there? Uh, I believe over thirty. I think it was thirty or thirty one. Uh, but with awesome. the priest and the religious uh, combined, I believe under His Excellency, he has about a hundred and thirty uh, priests and religious under his under his care. Whoa. And, but that's including Mexico. Right, right. So the CMRI, they have a presence here in the United States. We have about in about 35 states, but we also have a presence in 24 countries. 
Um, so we're pretty widespread in that aspect, and and that's with everyone combined with the priests and religious from these from different areas. And I think here, so you, right in Europe, you have obviously Germany here with Father Heine, and then is that counting Father Abrahamovich in Italy, and then um, obviously, or no, sorry, go ahead. And Father Riesling. And Father Riesling, right? And then. And Father- is that counting Father Legal in France or no? Yes. Yeah, Father Legal, okay. And then Father um, Christoph in Russia. Mm-hmm. And then Father Leg in, uh, in New Zealand. Oh, right, right. Wow. We have some, he has uh, some priests in, in uh, Argentina, I believe. Uh, he also has priests in, in uh, Mexico. And there's a group in Brazil, Franciscans, that are under his care as well, uh, ah, et cetera. Okay. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's it's just it's it's awesome to see to see how it grows, even in the 15 years since I've been in, you know, kind of part of the CMRI, and and I think I think you start to see that exponential growth that it it, it used to be that you'd have one priest every three years or so. And now you start to have these groups of priests and, and these groups of seminarians. And I think it, it, when it starts to grow and grow and grow, I think that's, that's, well, that's, it's beautiful to watch. And, and I think that's, that's also something we should also mention, obviously is that, that people really should pray for, for vocations and pray for priests. And, and, um, and I mean, I mean, you can explain what, what, what's the craziest um, trip that a priest has to do right now. Is, is there a really crazy one anymore for, for driving? Well, <laughs> before uh, Father Gekko was stationed in Arkansas, he was driving, oof, I believe it was 10, 11 hours, one way uh, on mission and covering several missions while he was down there and then driving back uh, to teach for school. So I would say that was pretty, a pretty crazy <laughs> mass route that he had. Unbelievable. And I think this, again, I think anyone listening to this, you, we cannot state enough how much prayers the priests need and, and not just obviously for their physical well-being and, and staying awake while they drive, but of course for their for their spiritual well-being, because they are obviously always under attack from the devil who sees this this strength coming from the CMRI and sees the success, you know, in more and more vocations. And of course, we'll always try to attack them more and more because of that. And that's one thing that I that I mentioned to people is the fact that it's not just a matter of for people the laity of thinking, oh, what what can I what the priest does for me, but what can I do for the priest and for the religious? Um, you know, they definitely need my uh, my prayers and and my sacrifices as well, and just that whole aspect of of it's a two way road, and we give and we receive, etc. Yeah, and and I think. And right, and I think, and be be supportive of the priest too. And that this 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 has really struck me one time. Um, I think I think it was even with you, Father, that that I was going through some you know pretty minor issue in my life, and I think I texted you or I called you a couple of times. I'm just kind of laying out my whole issues to you, and you know, Father, help me, you know, whatever. And it wasn't you know not the end of the world, but at the time it seemed like it. And then it kind of hit me. I think it, maybe days, weeks later, it's kind of like, you know, I don't think I even asked how father was doing, you know, and that, that, that's a, that's something we really need to remember. Like you say, I mean, to, let's not forget the priests. They, they are here to help us, but, but for goodness sake, you know, let, let's remember them and, and, and pray for them. And as you say, sacrifice for them, because, you know, the, if, if we don't, then, then that is to our detriment as well as to theirs, obviously. Exactly. And so I guess that's a good segue into your into your vocation, Father, and how how that came about. When did that start? When was that spark? Well, what was there a spark that 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 whispered in your ear? Hey, maybe I should be a priest. Yes. Yeah, so I actually grew up in an independent chapel in Oklahoma City. <clears throat> I grew up in at um, the, our, the Our Lady Queen of Angels in Oklahoma City it was an independent chapel under a priest by the name of Father Graham Walters. And if you've ever read the book. Um, put out by Angelus Press. It's uh, Priest, Where is Thy Mass? Mass, Where is Thy Priest? Uh, they have a section in there um, on Father Graham Walters, but he was an older priest who was ordained in the early 60s before the changes came about uh, in the in the church. And so he had this chapel there, and it was a small chapel. 
And I uh, was, like I mentioned earlier, just I, I never was exposed to other priests besides my parish priest, Father Walters. And he was an older man. And when I uh, started serving, I didn't even think of a religious or a priestly vocation at the time. I started serving, I believe I was about 10 or 11. And so it is when I began coming to uh, Catholic school, I believe I was 12 at the time, that was really when it hit me, when I started to really uh, think about uh, priestly vocation. And as I mentioned, it was because of the fact that I was exposed uh, to uh, priests that were younger, uh, religious, the bishop, uh, like I said, the sisters, and it really got me thinking. So it was, for me, I feel like it was a kind of hit me, so to say, all of a sudden. I, uh, when I first came to school out here, I believe it was in 2002, and it wasn't too much too much after uh, after I I came here, maybe a month or two after. I, it just really started to to wear on me or started to I started to really think about it Mm -hmm. and it was like I said mainly because of that influence that that I was around the the good influence of the priest and the the religious Um, up to that time like I said never thought about it Um, ever ever, only ever knew one priest and the example of my teachers etc was what helped spark that desire in me to give my life to God and I have to I have to interrupt here real quickly, Father, because I, I obviously knew you in this time around 2004, uh, 2005. And when I first met you, I kind of thought you were this very shy, kind of strange kid. I mean, that, that's honestly how I felt for the first couple of weeks or a couple of months. You you weren't really kind of the cool guy. You know, I was like, I wasn't really sure what to think about you. And I, a couple of months into the school year, um, I, I got chicken pox. And I mean, I really got chicken pox. I mean, one, one of the stories I remember from having the chicken pox, I, I had these scabs all over my face. And I think the bishop didn't believe really that I was that sick, or, or maybe he just came to check on me. I don't honestly know. <laughs> but he, he knocked on the door, I opened it up, and he literally like took a step backwards. He was like, oh. <laughs> so the bishop never questioned it again that I had chicken pox. So it was re- I was really, really sick. And and I just remember that, that Father, you came ar- along and you kind of you brought me food and you kind of checked on me and you cared, you know, kind of what was going on. And that really struck me that 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 was honestly, I think, for my side, at least where our friendship began um, in that time from from seeing you as being this kind of um, awkward, <laughs> awkward kid. They're like, hey, you know what? He's actually he's actually pretty OK. And I think that's that that was kind of where our relationship began because I had chicken pox. And here we are. Here we are, you know, 15 years later, um, Skyping. I'm in Germany and you're in Omaha and. And um, we've had some some fun times in between. And so when you were, after being in high school, you joined the seminary. How, how old were you when you first joined the seminary? So I was 18 at the time. And, uh, you know, interestingly, my my vocation was a little, uh, I would say it was tested and, it, and I was tried. I remember my first year in the seminary was very rough for me. I was, um, I had actually graduated from high school a year early uh, to join the seminary. And um, so actually, I was 17, just turning 18 at the time. And I and I, I was a year in the seminary, and it was pretty rough on me. And I started to question myself, is this really what I want to do? Is this what God is calling me to do? And I remember speaking to the bishop about it and asking for his advice. And one thing that really struck me was, is he said, do God's will. And I thought to myself, okay, do God's will. What is that? Right. And I prayed and discerned, and I decided um, to leave the seminary, actually, after that first year. And I, deci- I decided to go back home, um, in o- back to Oklahoma, and I w- ended up going to college for a couple of years. But during that time, I just always remembered the bishop's words, do God's will. And I just kept asking myself, well, what is God's will? And I continued to pray about it. And came a point where I had to make some decisions as to what I was going to do with my future. And I remember speaking to a couple of priests. Actually, I went up to help at a boys camp up in Colorado, the Knights of the Altar Boys Camp, which was where we first met, if I'm not mistaken. Right, exactly, yeah. And I was a counselor uh, at this by this time, and I just remember being very uh, touched by a talk that one of the priests uh, gave 
to the counselors and he said, don't be afraid to make a commitment. And I thought to myself, maybe that's what I was afraid to do in the first place, in the first time around. I was afraid to make a commitment and thought to myself, I, God may still be calling me and who am I to say no to God? He has done so much for me. Uh, he's redeemed me. He's died on the cross for me. Uh, and if this is what he's asking of me, who am I to refuse him what he wants and what he's asking of me? So I remember speaking to the priest after the talk, and he encouraged me uh, to go back to the seminary and give it another shot. So I made up my mind then and there to go back to the seminary. And uh, and I, after speaking to his excellency, he, he, he immediately said, yep, we'll expect you here. Uh, in a couple of weeks, by the time we uh, begin classes, and that was and that was um, what happened. So it was uh, it was it was always like I said, impressed by what the bishop had said. Do God's will, and I honestly was wanting to do God's will and praying uh, to do God's will. And sometimes it's it's the it's the smallest things or the smallest sentences right with the biggest impact i think that that is that is absolutely true and i think that that's a good example for anyone that you never know what you might say that can affect anyone about anything right i mean i think that's a really good point that especially people who are in developmental years i mean anything you say could affect them positively or negatively and i think that that's i mean obviously that's happened in my life i think that's happened in most people's lives that especially if you're in a place of of leadership or people who look up to you I mean, how important is it to to be careful what you say and be careful what you you know what you tell people and and to always have in mind that that it it could be taken um, very very seriously. And I think you made a really good point too about commitment. I, that that's such a good point. I think in in the the day to day that it that our generation and the younger generations especially I think really lack that ability to commit. That they're afraid that maybe something better could come along or that that something else might be right. And I think eventually you do just have to say, nope, no, this is this is what I'm going to do. And, and as we see with you, you committed and, and here you are. And, and you've been a priest eight years and and um, yeah, staying strong, I guess. I mean, you're kind of what, what is your role in Omaha, Father? So I, I helped His Excellency out here in the parish. So I would be considered an assistant uh, priest, assistant pastor here along with uh, uh, two other priests that are stationed here. And I help out in the academy, uh, in the high school in particular, and I, I, I teach. And then on the weekends, I go out to mission. I, I am pastor of Our Lady of the Snow in Denver, Colorado. So I, I travel out there every weekend and take care of, of the parish and any anything that needs to be taken care of. And during the week, I come back here and, and teach at the school and help out with anything else that needs to be uh, taken care of here in the parish in Omaha. So do you do you drive or do you fly to Denver? So Our Lady of the Snow is in, is in Denver. That's my my former parish as well. So so we have uh, another connection <laughs> connection there. Yes. So I actually I fly out every week. And so I, okay. I uh, Monday through Friday on Friday after school, I head to the airport and I and I take a flight out and it's um and it's an hour flight versus eight hours of driving. Right. That's a little easier. Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> that, that could be worse. And that, I mean, it, has that been a problem with the, the virus and, and whatnot? Is it a problem to fly or has it been fairly OK? I haven't had any problems at all. Okay. Um, it's been it's been pretty easy. Uh, flights have been um, I haven't had any major delays or any cancellations. And it's been I've been doing it since uh, July. I've been flying back and forth since July. And I uh, haven't had any any major issues. Oh, that's good. That, that is good. So so I guess I wanted to ask you regarding your vocation. Is there anything that that, that has come unexpected? Like, 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 is it what has happened in this vocation that is something you didn't expect going into it? Well, I'm putting you, I'm putting you on the spot. And I, I didn't prepare you for that question, but it hits me now. So. I I um. I didn't really set any expectations for myself, to be honest. I, mm -hmm. I just, I just came wanting to do God's will, and I said, whatever that is, uh, so be it. And I have to actually, I, I have to chuckle and I have to give, uh, tell you this, this little story. But when I was a deacon, I, when we are deacons, we are invited to our priest meetings, 
Uh, we have biannual priest meetings uh, with the secular priests and the CMRI priests meet together um, twice a year, or used to, and we would discuss uh, topics of uh, pertaining to moral theology, uh, pastoral uh, pastoral uh, issues, etc. But as a deacon, I was uh, coming to my first priest meeting, and the bishop said before the meetings that he was going to give me my assignment. And so he was going to tell me where I was going to be stationed once I was ordained. So I remember being very nervous mm-hmm. and uh, being very anxious. Oh, okay, this is it. I'm going to find out where I'm going to be uh, placed once I'm ordained. So I remember spending some time in chapel and really just asking the good Lord to, uh, you know, whatever, to help me accept his will and to put me in the best place that I would be able to do the most amount of good. And so, like I said, I was very nervous and very anxious. So we begin our, our, our meetings. And the first thing the bishop says is going to give uh, then uh, Carlos his assignment. And he pulls out three books. So he, he had had the sisters print out some um, some things and paste them onto some vocab books that, uh, that <laughs> so he gave them to me. So the first one, we're gonna we're gonna go father, we're gonna put father to the missions in Africa. And I was just really startled and very taken aback by that missions in Africa. <laughs> we don't have any missions there. So he pulled out one book. He said, uh, uh, "How to learn Swahili in in two." <laughs> Another one was um, how to live on five dollar five dollars a day in Nigeria, uh, and then I can't remember what the third one was, but he just totally uh, <laughs> pulled that a, a little joke on me. And uh, oh, that's beautiful. After the fact, he said, you know, when we don't have missions there, Father, you're gonna or Carlos, you're gonna be staying here in Omaha to help out. <laughs> that's awesome. Anyway, so was was that easier or harder than Africa would have been? <laughs> <laughs> That's the true question, right? <laughs> no, Omaha. Omaha is a beautiful place, and I mean, anyone who's been there and been around uh, His Excellency the Bishop and have been around the the seminarians and the priests and the nuns, there, it's it's an amazing thing that that it's kind of timeless, and I think it probably mostly revolves around around the bishop that that it's always it's often different faces and people are changing and the kids are always different, but, but it, it somehow remains the same. And I think that's, that's a really, for me, that's one of the most beautiful things about Omaha that I can go back, you know, now again, 15 years later from the first time I went there and it's, it's very different, but it's, it's very much the same. And that's something that that's really special for me. And, and just to have the nostalgia, but also to have that, the comfort of it is, is beautiful, but but it is also it's also pure chaos, as as we both know as well. That, that there is also something about Omaha that is that is organized chaos. I think is what we used to <laughs> to say, and that's I think I think it's it's an interesting thing too to see the the the, the strength and the preparedness that that religious come out of Omaha with, because it's it's kind of this ah, it is this nitty gritty you know i mean i you know I, I think compared to other seminaries it's 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 got this real toughness i think the bishop has that in him that that kind of that that down to earthness you know what i mean and maybe i'm describing it wrong but but i, I don't know if that makes sense no it's very practical and interesting because we have uh, a priest in russia who came to the seminary here father Krisov, but he said that this is the best seminary out there and he said the reason because it prepares you for the real world and it, it prepares you how to deal with with people and how to deal with with multiple demands on your time, et cetera. And I, yeah, I I agree. And it yeah, it, it's a it's a nice thing. And it's but I think what I see more and more even is also with that with that very down to earth, very you know. I don't even know how to describe it, comfortable, almost almost country style that, that there is in Omaha, then you watch these live streams that you can find on, on YouTube. I think, I know one of the channels on YouTube is um, Don Florian, which is um, Father Abra- uh, Abrahamovich from Italy, live streamed the videos. I don't know if anyone else did, but but there's live streams of, or I guess now a saved video, it was a live stream um, of the ordinations and the three solemn high masses that that, that you had this week and I just see the the beauty of it. I mean, I mean, really, the the it's just 
there's nothing like it. That there's nothing like it on earth. Now, obviously, there's nothing like the holy sacrifice of the mass. Of course, that is the most important thing we could ever possibly attend. But you watch these beautiful ceremonies and it, it even live streamed, even with not a great camera, it's it's incredibly touching. Mm-hmm. Yes, in the Pontifical High Mass, especially, there's it's so intricate, and there's so much that goes to it, and the movements, and the and the different places that one has to be at, and it's and, it's, and also for the uh, sol- uh, solemn High Mass. Uh, but yes, very very beautiful, and very there's just a, 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 a beauty that is not of this world, and it just truly it shows forth that this is of God, that this is um, from above, so to say. Absolutely. And I think it's inspiring. I mean, really, anyone listening to this, definitely go and find these videos. Maybe I'll even link them to this video because because it, I, even if you can't be there, even if it's not live, it is really a beautiful, beautiful thing to watch and and to to hear the choir. And, and that's something else, too. I mean, really interesting with the, the different choir um, and the different masses they sing. And I think the different... Um, cultures and i think that's something that that we mentioned before the 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 stream was that um the three different priests are are extremely different cultures right yes we have well one of the priests was he is he's he's an american from connecticut but then we also had um the one of the priests ordained was from mexico and another one was from austria and And and, oh sorry go ahead no and i definitely as we spoke about before i i almost felt that their personalities were uh, came through, so to say, in the different pieces of music that they that they chose for their first masses. The mass itself that they had sung, um, I think, uh, a tribute where it was an attribute to their personalities. And I think that that's that's a, another beautiful thing. And I saw that when when my brother, Father Philip Marie uh, of the CMRI, when he got ordained in 2018, I, I could look at his choir you know the, the the plan for the music and i could see it was his plan because there were there were hymns that that we grew up with as as kids there were, there was a hymn that i knew was my grandmother's favorite hymn and i knew that he did that for her purposely like as a special thing for her i think and that's that's such a i think this is it's an amazing thing and you know you talk to people in today's world and i think people look at catholicism as being this old man's religion and this stale dry angry you know bad thing and, I, and you see this and i just i don't I, they're not seeing what what we're seeing obviously right and it's one of the things i actually spoke about that this past sunday how people many people may get the miss the the have the misunderstanding or the impression that if you're trying to be a good catholic you're going to, you're you're doomed to be miserable the rest of your life and that is far from the truth it's that's absolutely absurd to think that uh, there's just a beauty and there's a richness to our Catholic faith, and there's a joy that should come from that, uh, that a joy of, uh, of, of heart uh, in serving the Lord and doing His work and uh, in following His will. And that's that's something that, especially this past Sunday being Gaudete Sunday, um, you know, we're told to rejoice in the Lord and to rejoice always. Right, and, and, and exactly, and, and be optimistic and i think that we we so much need that these days and i think that people need to find that optimism and it's not easy i mean father over here in in europe we have most of our our parishes are very small i mean many of them are are mostly with elderly people and, and it gets better here in germany there are more kids every 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 year you have a couple more it seems to to, to start to fill out the parishes which is amazing but there are still it's more of a struggle in america you really have the numbers in these big ceremonies and here you really don't and i think i think it's something that that oh, i wish i wish we could bring that here and i know that you and, and his excellency were going to come obviously this this spring i think in march right but it didn't work out because of corona but um oh, it's, it's something that i hope someday we can get that here somehow and or, or get the, the the europeans to america to see the the splendor and the glory, because we don't need it for our faith, but but it it does help us as humans, right? Yes, for sure. And but it, it and I I think that's one of the real neat things about having been able to live stream uh, these ceremonies is that even you know for yourself or for others being a, a, you know, halfway across the world, you're still able to participate and partake in the in the beauty of those ceremonies. And I think that's one of the one of the benefits of, of our modern day technology is that we're able to give or to show the beauty of our Catholic faith. Yeah, absolutely. And, and with that beauty, I think you, you get 
hopefully, God willing, more vocations. And that that's kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about was if if you are someone in, in Europe or in America or anywhere that is watching these live streams and, and, and has that thought of, you know, maybe maybe that's what what god is calling me to do or maybe that's what i should do or or perhaps i have a vocation what what would you suggest for them i mean what what's the what's the first step even if you get that tiny whisper in your ear what should they do well i think first and foremost prayer that's the most important aspect of a vocation is that it's fostered through means of prayer and secondly the mass and the sacraments and so for someone who would be reflecting upon the possibility of a, of a religious or priestly vocation, I always try to encourage them to uh, really, like I said, deepen their prayer life, to really strive uh, to uh, focus on their spiritual life through means of spiritual reading, uh, through means of meditation, um, and then obviously the Mass and the Sacraments, frequent uh, reception of the Mass, of, of, of the Sacraments. And secondly, I would also say is that they have a confessor that they can confide in and ask for their guidance and direction. Um, and I and I believe that the, doing those things and, and asking God to help him to show you the way will definitely open those doors and help and open your eyes to help you to follow through uh, with whatever God's will may be for you in your life. And what if that's someone who who lives in I don't know Poland or or somewhere else that might be listening that that might feel this and does not have the access to a confessor or even possibly the access to the sacraments? I mean, is that something that they should they reach out to a priest or what should they do? Most definitely, I would say that they should reach out to a priest and have contact with with someone that they can uh, ask for guidance and uh, and and get advice from. And also, if they're ever ever able to make a trip to visit, you know, say, for example, one of the seminaries or one of the religious houses, uh, that they do so. That I know that many places, uh, this, for example, the CMRI sisters, they ha have a vocations week every year. Um, I know that the religious uh, brothers were, are working on providing a vocations week. Um, I know for ordinations, that's always a good time to come and visit the seminary here. Um, but if they're able to, to make a visit and be able to observe the life that a priest or religious lives. Uh, I think that's huge. And then if they're not able to, you know, in the meantime, at least reaching out to someone that they, a priest or even a religious, uh, that they can uh, ask for guidance and for counsel and for advice uh, when it comes to a vocation. And why do you think, Father, why, why should they, why should they witness it? Why, why do you think they should see it? <sighs> I would say it's one thing to, for example, read about a vocation, but it's a totally different thing to actually see it uh, put into practice. Because, you know, sometimes we might we might lose a sight of 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 certain things, or we might overlook certain things um, when we read about them, and then when we're actually exposed to them, it, it like I said, it takes on a totally different view uh, in our minds. And I, I, like I said, for myself, I would have never have even thought of a vocation had it not been for my exposure to the example of the priest and the religious. I can say that without any shadow of doubt in my mind, um, that it was the, their good example that in their, in, in, in my being around them that really helped, uh, that really sparked that desire within me. And I, I can say also from, from friends that I know that are, and, and relatives that are, that are sisters, um, I have, I have a sister who is also a CMD nun and she, it, she had, I think the expectations correctly, but, but I know that when she first started, she was, I think waking up at four 30 in the morning to milk cows. Is that right? Four thirty five, something like that. Yes. So, I mean, it's, it's like it's, it's those, even those difficult things become right. when done for the love of God and uh, right, they, right. They, exactly. They light. Right. And I think that, right. And, and if you, I guess my point being that you don't want to only have the idea that, that these, these videos of the solemn mass and the beautiful choir, that's not the only part of it. Obviously much of it, most of it even is, is the nitty gritty and the, the everyday life of, of hard work and, and labor and doing things that 
you yourself obviously probably don't want to do. I don't think my sister ever wanted to get up herself, you know, at four o'clock in the morning to milk cows. That's not a natural thing to want to do, but it's obviously something that she did for the love of God and, and, and to, you know, further herself in that vocation and, and, you know, in obedience and, and whatnot. But I think that that's something that you do obviously have to go in with the right perspective. But I think you can speak to that too, that this is with any vocation in, in life, right? Correct. I mean, there's always going to be your hardships, but there's always going to be uh, those joys as well. So I, I think it's important not to, uh, and I think that's for example, for myself, I, I, in my mind, maybe I might have had um, expectations that were not realistic. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we, you know, we want to make sure that we realize that with any vocation, there's going to be uh, hardships, but there will be joys as well. And not to over look the fact that it's not always going to be easy. Exactly. I mean, I being a, a dad now, I can tell you that my little daughter is the cutest thing that ever, ever happened to the earth, but she's also teething. And so she's also the worst thing that's ever happened to the earth. So, you know, so that, that is, that is just, that's life of, that's any vocation. I think that especially in these tar, these hard times, you know, in these times of, of kind of crisis, really in, in, in times where the world every possible way is against us and it, it is doing everything it can to go be against God and against morality and against everything we should stand for. I, I still think it's vitally important to be optimistic and to be, to have that joy. And, and I think that's how, how I would want to end this, this podcast father is how, how can people be optimistic? How can they, they not lose their, their, their hope, I guess, in, in these tough times? Well, I think it's important that we keep focus on what's most important in this life. And I'm sure that everyone's aware of the, of the many uh, political situations around the world, um, especially here in the United States. Um, things um, not not the easiest and a lot of unrest and a lot of a lot of uh, troubles. But I think when we put things into, into the proper perspective and we see that regardless of what happens in our society, regardless of who sits in the White House or what goes on here or there, that our purpose never changes. Our focus should always be on making it to heaven. As we know in our catechisms, we are here to know, love, and serve God so as to be happy with him in the next. And that's the whole purpose of why we're here. And that will never change, regardless of what goes on in our world about us. And so having that that stability and that that uh determination of, and, and that and that firm purpose in our life, I think will definitely help to not get discouraged, to help us not uh, get down when things uh, seem rough, but to know that the times of difficulty are usually the times of the greater saints. And this is the time where God is going to be raising great saints in, in the church. And that should give us hope because we should be we should rise up to the occasion. We know that we can do all things in God who strengthens us. So I think that in and in, in and of itself should be a great consolation to many of us. Perfect, Father. Yep. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um that's great. I think that's a good good way to wrap it up. I would love to have you on again. I, I would love to talk about more about Bishop Carmona, and, and I'm sure there are plenty of other topics we can come up with in the future. Um we'll see if if you know, my first one or two listeners to this podcast will uh, give us a, a thumbs up. Um, if you do, if you have any questions for, for Father, I'm sure he would have no problem with you contacting him. But go ahead and do it through me. I will attach my, my email address to this video so you can contact me and then I can ask Father if it's okay to send that through to him. If you have any questions about vocations or, or anything about the CMRI, you know, the, the, the traditional Latin mass, we are very, very willing and, and able to to help you. So please comment on this video and I will send you to the right person to answer those questions. Father, thank you so much for being on. It's been it's been fun. It's been informative. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess we will talk to you to you next time. You have any anything to, to end with? Nope. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Father. God bless. All right. God bless you, too.